In the last videos we discussed diastolic dysfunction grade 1, grade 2 and grade 3. It is time now to move on to the specific situation if you find that diastolic dysfunction is indeterminate. What does it mean? How does it look like in the chart of the guidelines? Well, it's the situation when you have one criteria which is positive, one criteria which is negative, and you cannot measure the third criteria. So let's recall we have the mitral valve inflow, we have the situation where this E to A ratio below or 0.8 plus the E maximal velocity above 50 centimeters per second or simply the E to A ratio which might be the most common situation of above 0.8 but below 2. The three criteria we already discussed have to be evaluated. The average E to E prime above 14 is considered pathological the TR velocity above 2.8 meters per second, which is pathological, and the left atrial volumetric index, so above 34 milliliters per square meter, it's considered pathological. And if you have only two of the three criteria present, for example, very often it will be that TR velocity is not accurately measurable, you have only two criteria, so the average E to E prime and the LA volume index, you have one positive and one negative, we simply do not know in this situation, when you only have two available criteria, so for example, the average E to E prime above 14 or the LA volume index above 34 milliliters per square meter, and you cannot measure which will be, I would say, mostly the case that you cannot accurately measure tricuspid regurgitation, you have only those criteria present. And if one is positive and one negative, for example, you have an E to E prime ratio of 10 and an LA volume index of 38 milliliters per square meter. You have one positive, one negative criteria. You're in the situation of indeterminate. So you do not know if diastolic dysfunction with elevated feeling pressures is present or not. According to new literature, still we can measure left atrial strain. In left atrial strain, we have several phases and functions we have to differentiate. We have the reservoir function, you can see it here painted in red, the conduit function, and at the end, the atrial contraction phase. So the reservoir function is the filling of the left atrium. It's the aortic valve opening until the aortic valve closure. Then it continues with the mitral valve opening until the mitral valve closure. So the conduit function is then the filling of the left ventricle, so pumping out the blood of the left atrium. Then there are several measurements we can have. So the first measurement is the pulse, the peak atrial longitudinal strain, and the second is the PAX, the peak atrial contraction strain. There are norm values. The first norm value for the pulse is around 39%, so it's a positive value, and the PAX is approximately 17%. It's also a positive value. If you measure those two and if you know those phases, you can help to identify also the situations where it might be indeterminate with the prior known markers. If you compare the LA strain with the ECG, you see that there's the QS complex and the second QRS complex, the T wave and the P wave, and this is how it looks like. So at first we have the filling of the left atrium and then the filling of the left ventricle in diastole. Why would you measure this? Why would you measure LA strain in diastolic dysfunction? Well, the LA strain, if it's pathological, it's better than the left atrial volumetric index in regards of identifying if there's diastolic dysfunction really present. If you combine the measurements of left atrial strain and the left atrium volumetric index, you will have a better detection of diastolic dysfunction. If you have a pulse, a peak atrial longitudinal strain below 23%, it will show you that there are more hospitalizations in these patients, even double the amount of hospitalizations, and the patient will be more symptomatic. So the patient will experience more dyspnea. So the measurements of the pulse and the PAX, they are quite important, but also keep in mind to combine these measurements with the left atrial volumetric index. The better we measure, the more accurate we measure, the more better we get in the detection of actual diastolic dysfunction. If we talk now about diastolic dysfunction and the elevation of filling pressures, there is a nice paper where it was identified that the pulse, a peak atrial longitudinal strain below 18% is very likely to have a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure above 12 millimeters of mercury in situations of a reduced systolic function versus a preserved systolic function. So the ejection fraction was taken into account and in a reduction of ejection fraction, this marker, the pulse below 
was quite good. In preserved ejection fraction, this marker alone was not perfect, but gives a hint towards elevated filling pressures. In a case where the pulse is even lower, below 16%, the pulmonary capillary edge pressure is most likely to be above or 50 millimeters of mercury, so elevated. The PUX, the peak atrial contraction strain, was very good to identify normal filling pressure. So a PUX above 14% identifies normal filling pressure, so a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure below or 12 millimeters of mercury quite accurately in a normal functioning left ventricle, so in a global longitudinal strain of above minus 18. The PUX below 8% was a quite good marker to denote elevated feeling pressure. So if the peak atrial contraction strain is elevated, the feeling pressures are elevated as well.